Hello, welcome to the second edition of the Open Signal uh, podcast, even though it is uh, recorded uh, with images as well as uh, audio. Uh, I'm James Robinson. This is Samuel Johnston. And we have, uh, we're very lucky to have Colin Anderson from MLab with us. So uh, Colin and I were just speaking, we spoke for the first time a couple of hours ago, and he's been brave enough to be our very first guest. Um, so Colin, tell us a little bit about what MLab is and, and what you do there. Sure. So Measurement Lab is actually one of the world's largest repositories on, on network information. What's interesting about it is it's collected from real users and it's ubiquitous. So what, what we end up having is a broad consciousness of the state of, of, for example, broadband connectivity across the world, not just developing countries, not just particular individuals who have certain issues or certain intentions but mm -hmm. really like what users in de the developing world in in, a, in de democratic countries in authoritarian countries in any sort of situation have how the internet looks to them right so it, it's basically a network testing tool somewhat similar to um speed test or, or to the, the speed test that we have, have in our app as well mm -hmm. um i guess one of the key differences is that um, measurement lab release the data yeah. publicly and it's got uh, is it a CC0 license yes so we have about a petabyte worth of data this is about 80,000 uh, tests per day uh, from across the world what's different from us is is that is is the level of openness that we aspire to the there is transparency in the methodology there is open source on the back end mm -hmm. Uh, there is just uh, the end data is generally licensed uh, mostly as, as CC0. So the idea is open measurement is the only way, it, open measurement, but really for the sake that open measurement is the way that ultimately policy and our understanding of the internet should, see, should be as opposed to, you know, proprietary viewpoints, you know, closed door view, mm -hmm. viewpoints, data that's locked into non-disclosure agreements. And right. Those sorts of and I think that's, you know, kind of philosophy we share in the sense mm -hmm. that we believe the whole kind of um, transaction between provider and user in a kind of crowdsourced network requires uh, the company collecting the data to share a lot of it back, yeah. to make a lot of it public. And I think, so I think that kind of matches actually very well with kind of how yeah. we view our own um, network testing software. Mm, definitely. Um, and, you know, and a bit later, we're going to talk about... Um, about our own our recent report on 4G speeds, so I think this is quite a nice kind right, of way. Right, which of, is a um, good example. I think where we differ is we're not making our data immediately available open source, but I guess we sort of try to add the analysis and then mm -hmm. present it to our users. Um, but um, so I I think one of the interesting things about um, Measurement Lab that that came up on our discussion was just one of the ways that you collect a test, for instance, is is it um, BitTorrent um, clients and and uh, maybe you can explain this to me again, but I, I believe they, they're they using MLab to test mm -hmm. to optimize their settings. So so we have a number of partnerships, and they range from private en entities that have a commercial self-interest mm -hmm. self to regulated regulators. And so in the case of BitTorrent, for example, BitTorrent has, a, has a, an operational interest in being able to understand its network conditions, how it affects performance, you know, what's the latency, what's the loss, mm -hmm. these are all very critical to the functionality. And so what we get is we get this sort of, uh, everyone gets a return. Mm -hmm. uh, so then BitTorrent is able to learn about its network conditions by running what's called the network diagnostic tool, one of the MLab hosted tests. Uh, it understands it, the, operate, the environment it operates in, and then we get the, the data in re return. This is also repeated for a number of other uh, tools, not to the extent that, that BitTorrent, or rather, not to the, the mass adoption right. that BitTorrent. Uh, but also we, we have, for example, regulators have their own tests. Right. Um, they use NDT as well. So this, these are all, what's really interesting about this is that means that BitTorrent can go and run NDT. Mm -hmm. The Greek regulator can run NDT, but it's the same NDT, and so what you get is you get this large volume of data that is a, sort of a collective commons that is all cross-comparable, is all the same test, mm -hmm. um, but is being used, therefore, by different people for different purposes, both on the input as well as out on the output. So this um, gets me on to, I think, the, most, the thing I'm most eager to talk about, which mm -hmm. is... Um, some research that you've done with the measurement lab data um, with regards to censorship. So mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much away here. So I'll, I'll let you 
tell us um, you know, what did you find and what did you do? So I, I think that what this speaks to, firstly, is when you have open methodology, so when you understand the components of the system, but when you have open data as well, what that means is you're not necessarily always having to de design a specific test for a specific function that only you know. Mm -hmm. You can sort of collect. And so we collect as much as possible and retain as much as possible so that the people who have a question that we don't necessarily envision uh, can come to us and say, I know how to parse that data. Mm. And so actually my first involvement with, with MLAB was uh, I, I sort of, I, I've, I've had a long relationship with Iran. Mm -hmm. And one of the rumors had always been, you know, when, when there's a protest, the internet slows down. Mm. And, but but I'm, a, I'm a computer scientist, so I want methodology, I want proof. You, just want, you don't want anecdotes, you want to see the right, facts. Right, yeah, right, okay. exactly. Um, and, and I'm a computer scientist who actually has relationships with human rights mm -hmm. organizations, with uh, the Special Rapporteurs for Human Rights. So, so I want evidence that can go into a policy process. Mm -hmm. I want to be right. able to show to journalists this is, this is ultimately, uh, you know, when it happened, how it happened, how much it happened. And so what MLAB allowed me to do is I could say, oh, there's a lot of tests coming from Iran on mm -hmm. a daily basis from a heterogeneous set of users. I know how to parse that. Mm. So let's take the downloads throughput and let's compare it to this day, which was an average day. Mm -hmm. But then, oh, uh, February 22nd, 2012, there was a critical protest. Let's see how the internet was that day. Oh, there was an 80% difference. Oh, mm -hmm. that continued over the course. Oh, during the election, actually that decreased substantially and remained substantially lower. And, and it, only, it only sort of broke. The normal internet only came back the day after the election. Wow, that's really interesting. That's yeah. a fascinating It's not point. actually, you know, not that it would kind of contribute anything. It's something that I'd love to go back and look at our data. I, mean, yeah. I don't know how many kind of speed tests we have from Iran. But it's really mm. interesting to see whether we could kind of see that in our own data. I think it's very just I, kind of point of personal interest, really. I think it sort of goes back to... Uh, I think we talked about this perhaps in the sensor network um, discussion on our last podcast. About which, yeah. not knowing what data is going to be useful exactly, when you collect it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Sometimes, um, so an example that we found is we, we collected um, battery temperature data and we thought it might be useful mm -hmm. to, to understand where, um, perhaps the impact of LCE, perhaps being a more power-hungry technology, maybe users' batteries would, would heat up or um, areas of or a signal might have uh, hotter batteries uh, on aggregate. We didn't find any of that, <laughs> but <laughs> really? we did yeah. found we we did find a strong correlation between aggregate battery temperatures and outdoor air temperatures. <laughs> um, so you could actually see, yeah, okay, there's lots of noise causing the battery temperature to heat up or or, or, or cool down, mm. um, but there's one sort of thing that you know uh, modulates on aggregate. Yeah. Um, the user the, the the battery temperature and that's the outdoor air temperature but um it, so it, it's really fascinating to think i i guess mlab probably never envisioned um this particular use case of their data mm. and it's really interesting so you weren't actually involved with mlab before this project right okay right so so this is the point of of the openness aspect which right. is you know, as an organization, we'll never be able to understand the totality of, of mm. the, the uh, information we're collecting. We run across different people in, in different policy environments, different international forum, and they have these questions that I would have never thought about, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. So it's like uh, we have this issue of data localization, for example. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden people, because of concerns about international surveillance, want to localize the routing of their network. How does that change it? That probably exists, but you know, as an organization, I can never anticipate what the interesting question is to everyone in every uh, every environment, for every country, for every situation, for the entirety of the time. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I don't have to. Right. Yeah, collect the data, and they will come. I think. And make the, make it open. Yeah, yeah. Make sure the methodology is accurate. Make sure that uh, that it's it, there's a low barrier of entry, which is very difficult. Um, but lower the barrier of entry and 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 uh, hope that people have better questions than I have. Okay, so um, what's what's next for your research? Are you looking into to more ways that you can detect uh, censorship or, or expanding this study? 
So, so what we're broadly interested in is expansion into the policy context. So, mm. I think the really eventful year, it was a very eventful year for MLAB last year in that we released a, a study on, on interconnection performance in the mm. United States. And what we saw, that what we were able to interject is, is that, for example, for the past couple of years, people have complained about the way that Netflix affects traffic. <clears throat> right. Mm. And they, and, uh, and they've said, my Netflix is slower. But what is in play actually there is that Netflix is using particular transit providers. Right. So this is how, this is basically how the data gets from Netflix yeah, to exactly. my phone or my tablet or, or computer or whatever. Exactly. Mm. And, and, and that route can be very different for, for, different, for users of different networks or, or different internet providers. And obviously this plays in very closely with the whole net neutrality kind right. of uh, debate that's going on at the moment. Exactly. It's a public policy issue. And, mm. and ultimately what the public policy issue is, you have a last mile ISP, the person mm -hmm. who's providing access for your tablet, for your home, for your computer. And they have a connection to another network. And, they, and those two uh, connections, the connection that Netflix has, the connection that your home has, is sitting behind what's called an interconnection. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be upgraded because it has a finite amount of capacity. And so what mm -hmm. we found was there wasn't upgrades for a certain amount of time for some reason that was unlikely to be a, a technical uh, reason. So how did that, what we could do is we could go back and say, okay, we have actually MLAB sites sitting behind that interconnection, mm -hmm. and, and we have users on the other side. So what we're seeing is we're seeing how the interconnection performance changes over time. And we have a heterogeneous placement of, of, of sites across other transit providers. So we could say, oh, that, that, that interconnection all of a sudden over the day, uh, over, the, uh, over a couple of years, decreased in performance over time. And then we could also say, mm -hmm. you know what's interesting is if you, you cut it diurnally, so mm -hmm. across the day, at, at midnight it was it was pretty decent, but uh, in, you know it continued on at 5 a.m. it was pretty decent. But all of a sudden when people got on their interconne interconnection or internet connection and they were all fighting for this fixed mm -hmm. allocation that wasn't enough, they were competing for fixed resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. And their share got lower and lower. Mm -hmm. And as it, as it progressed, as the problem got worse, as people were requesting more content, as the streams for, for, for things got bigger, as people had more uh, subscriptions, all of a sudden more and more people were demanding more and more of interconnections that weren't growing. And what you could see on the MLAB data is that at a certain point, say like uh, January 2014, uh, for those interconnections, no matter how fast your home uh, connection was, Half a megasecond. Right. right. You could buy a hundred mega, uh, you know, FiOS connection, mm. for example, half a megasecond. Doesn't matter what what I hardware mean, you've got at home, like. Because this is quite similar to some research that on the paper that actually I think Willis does co-authors on that Joe wrote, looking right. at the kind of throughput of LTE networks, where we kind of examines the kind of various mm -hmm. variables that uh, impact on LTE connections. Because I think most people kind of think mm. of networks as just, you know, uh, on the round trip as just being, you know, my device to a kind of server and it's just one thing it's in between. Cloud. Exactly, the cloud right. to your device. And actually there are so many factors mm. that impact yeah. on network performance. Yeah. And so we've seen fantastic, like really interesting hour kind of changes to LTE, was, hour mm. of the day stuff, yeah. device impact. Like it's been, yeah, it's been really interesting. And it was, I'm sure you found the same thing, but we did see that the hour of the day profile varied by day. So during the mm. week you mm -hmm. had quite a particular profile and obviously at the, week, the weekend, weekend people yeah. get up later. So and we do quite yeah, a lot of uh, uh, peak against kind of off-peak analysis, peak kind of being 9am yep. to 6pm during the week. And mm. we see kind of often huge differences in network performance mm. between the two. So, you know, it's just kind of very interesting and not something that people really think about. So so this is the power of data though. This is the power mm. of data that Open Signal has. This is the power of, of data that, that Measurement Lab uh, tries to, to leverage as well, which is users don't know that. Yeah, exactly. If you think that it's a cloud, it's just slow. And that's also, that, that reinforces a cycle. If you mm -hmm. think it's a cloud and you think it's just slow, uh, slow, you don't necessarily understand that there are components that are failing within that yeah. network. Mm -hmm. that, that, is a, that has policy implications. And it, mm -hmm. it holds the pro various providers, makes them accountable. Yeah. You know, I think this is all about no matter you know, who it is. It, is that there's never been you know on the side of the consumer there's been really in, inefficient market information which has led to kind of poor decision making and kind of uh, incorrect demand. Mm -hmm. And I, so I think it's really important that companies like Emna, companies like OpenSignal, are making this kind of 
what to most consumers would seem like slightly esoteric data, yeah. making it available, easily understandable, and helping kind of people to hold that kind of slow internet performance, holding the right people to account. Absolutely. And, and, and in that respect, what's important to Measurement Lab is, is that we only want to say what the data can say. Yeah. Everything, this is also the benefit of, of openness. <clears throat> so when we release this report, a large portion of it is, this data is open, but not only is, is the data open, but we're going to open our methodology. Mm -hmm. We're going to create a toolkit for you to be able to extract this data yourself. We're going to extract it and post it publicly. Yeah. We're going to even do the make file that was responsible mm -hmm. for our graphs to be, to be available. And then we're also going to have a web interface to be able to reproduce this in real time. The web interface too, by the way, is open. So if you disagree with anything that I've said, by all means, use <laughs> any of that. Tell me I'm wrong. You know, like uh, file a pull request right. against my yeah. repository. So, yeah, it sounds like an absolutely fantastic resource. I think we're definitely gonna have to check it out and see if we can find some kind of interesting kind of points of comparison. With oh, it, it is fascinating. Sites. There's there's like a great the visualizations on 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 MLab are, are are really interesting. Like you can run sort of without being a researcher, you can use those mm -hmm. tools to run some quite nice pieces of in, in quite nice investigations. Um, well, I'm conscious that yeah. um, we did bring you... We don't you... want to turn this into a three-hour three hour event on this a Friday really night. Fun, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to get you in again. We, we did invite you for a beer, and, and you've uh, ended up giving us a, a lot of your time. And I know you're, no, kind of insight I know you're late for dinner, that. so um, I don't know if you have any sort of closing remarks you want to, to give. <laughs> now, the state of now the made it even harder. Uh, because until you've given us a brilliant soundbite, yeah. we're not letting you <laughs> no, it's, no, it's really been fascinating and um, yeah. thank you yeah. so much for thank you so much for coming on so so I will say this mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I found in the past couple of years is that uh, we're, we exist in a policy context that doesn't have measurement doesn't have facts mm. and and I'm an optimist because what I've has been continually reinforced to me is that if you can prove yourself if you can do the network measurement if you can assert facts into a situation, you're in a stronger position than you would have imagined. And I think that as, as these, these sorts of methodologies grow, as we mature as a community, as we have collaborations, as we interrogate our methodology, as we build out and as we progress, I'm, I'm optimistic that, that we can start to say, this is what the internet is. This is why it's important to us. This is where measurement fits in this whole thing, but this is how we have a healthy internet. And, and I, I'm hopeful, um, and I think that we, we now have the tools in order to, to sort of maintain the health of these networks that are critical to our lives. And I think that kind of data-driven policy approach is something that we can, I mean, hopefully assume will take over more areas of policy than just mm. the internet. And I, I think, so. let's, let's be optimistic, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, on, on that note, thank Colin you. Anderson, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm you. a fan. Thank you guys. Thank for you. Having me on. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. All right. Cool. That was great. Wow. Thank you. Great. Uh, so we're back with Bob Horvitz, who I think can probably introduce himself better than I can. Just want to say a, say a few words. Hi, Samuel. Good. Hi, James. <laughs> I'm Bob Horvitz, and I'm visiting London to, uh, I just come from a meeting at Ofcom yesterday, talking about spectrum for future wireless technologies, and uh, happy to visit you guys. Well, I don't know what else to say. Well, great to have you here. Uh, so obviously, we just kind of finished talking um, with Colin about um, about data driven policy, and I gather you've done kind of uh, a lot of work on white space and trying to kind of help form. Uh, I mean, I may be wrong about this. Trying to help kind of inform government, the U.S. government position on white space. Is that correct? Not the U.S. government. Oh, the sorry, European right. Commission. That was um, it. I, I've been very interested in white space because I'm I'm basically a supporter of. Um, liberalized access to the radio spectrum and to the extent that cognitive radio as it's called uh, does some of the spectrum management work that governments traditionally had done um, the introduction of cognitive radio can re re reduce the need for government control of spectrum access okay and that's something i support should we uh yeah. stop it from the beginning and say kind of what is white space yeah because there's two great words there yeah, white, white space, space and cognitive, and cognitive radio, radio. And, so uh, okay we've let's, gone... let's let's start from the beginning so what is white space white space are the gaps between assigned tv channels right tv mm -hmm. receivers were, were designed to be as affordable as possible 
which meant that they're not very selective. And that means that they're, they're subject very easily to interference from nearby signals in adjacent channels. So when TV channels are assigned, they leave gaps in the spectrum just so that people don't have interference on their receiver, mm -hmm. you know, the TV in their home. But uh, it's possible to fit other users in those white spaces if they're yes. low power because okay. the range or the, the, the possibility of interference is much lower than if they were a TV transmitter. TV transmitters tend to be very powerful, okay. so they cover big areas. But um, it's possible to put something like Wi-Fi in those white spaces, mm -hmm. and the risk of interference is much lower than if it was a TV station in that same channel. Okay. So, so with the U.S. government, uh, much to everyone's shock, uh, about 13 years ago, first started to propose to allow unlicensed use of these white spaces by right. Wi-Fi-like devices. And their idea was that rural areas could benefit from lower cost equipment. Excuse me, because the signal uh, propagation for um, that frequency range is really excellent, and you can yes, have fewer right. base stations because covering you need, a large you need area. TV signals to go much further. Right. So, so your right. kind of so, so your work is kind of concerned with. I mean, obviously, in, in the UK, we had the kind of um, these kind of incredibly valuable spectrum auctions that happened uh, for three G right. and four G. So, I think you know it's quite well understood that spectrum is a limited resource. Mm -hmm. So, you're kind of saying that you know traditionally. Um, television stations have made quite inefficient use of spectrum just based no, on kind no, of... No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that. S spectrum is a limited resource. Mm -hmm. It's limited not by the availability of spectrum, but by the technology that uses the spectrum. I, I meant inefficient in the sense as, they use kind of all the technology. Yeah, yeah, as technology improves, you can get more efficient uses of right. spectrum. Okay. And it's almost like having more spectrum. Excellent. That's what I was getting at. I think yeah. I phrased it, phrased and, it badly. And, and just yeah. to clarify, this, this Wi-Fi, it's not like... The Wi-Fi that we have here in the office that's just going from this router up right. on the wall down to us. Right. This is this is a wide area network, so it's covering. You'll have a base station that a whole community can access. It's it's the kind of um, service that an internet service provider would offer customers, right? On, a, on an either commercial basis or a community network or something like that. So or it can be Internet of Things, of course. So instead of but someone the, having a cable to your home and then you having a Wi-Fi router there, right. you have the Wi-Fi router somewhere downtown or... or 10 miles hills. away. Right, okay. Because the signals really go far. But when you coexist with TV stations, you really have to avoid causing interference. And there's several ways to do that. Either you can have sensing capabilities so the device can sense what signals are in the air and mm -hmm. pick a frequency that's not being used no. or you can have some kind of service that tells you what frequencies are unused in certain locations that's called database control so that's the first thing. google has right. is, is that google's that's right. um so google's created a database yeah of the governments that have tested white space devices mm -hmm. have reached the conclusion that they're not the sensing process is not reliable enough mm -hmm. to allow uh, devices to be autonomous and simply monitor the air and make the decision on their own what they think is an empty channel. Um, mm -hmm. the, the system which is being implemented in most countries, if it's being implemented at all, um, is to have a database know where the TV stations are and what frequencies they're using and the white space, white space devices have to report their location to the database mm -hmm. and then the database tells them what frequencies are available in that location. Sense network. That's called geodatabase control. And that's right. the system which is being developed in the UK, for instance, where, mm -hmm. where we are now, and the other countries that are planning to allow white space um, devices. So, so in the terms of all these, um, now we sort of have this framework. Can you explain what a cognitive radio is? Because I, I absolutely love right. that term. Right. Well, it's it's a wonderful term. It's yeah, it? kind of used to be kind of poetic. Um, it, it's it's a, a radio which is smart enough to uh, sense its environment mm -hmm. and make a judgment, an autonomous judgment of what frequencies can be used without causing interference to the existing okay. signals. So it's, that's the other approach, that's the non-database right. approach. TV white spaces are not, uh, TV white space devices are not cognitive radios. Right. They're slave devices which are taking orders from the database. Mm -hmm. They do not have any independent judgment over what 
frequencies are available. So, so I'm and, getting the impression that you're an advocate for the, the, the cognitive radio. That's break. right. Mm. That's right. Because my, my interest and my motivation, I must say, is to reduce the amount of government interference in communications right. of all sorts. Good, uh, good aim to uh, Wireless uh, communications in particular. And cognitive radios advance that cause, mm -hmm. and uh, database control does not. In fact, it's a it's a very dramatic it's a very dramatic expansion of government authority over right. unlicensed devices. If you have a kill switch in your radio, as all white space devices must uh -huh. have, the government can simply deny authorization, and you you lose access to the internet. It's a nice link to what we were talking about with with, yeah. with Colin earlier about you know detecting uh, censorship or you know there's obviously mm. evidence of, of wide-scale uh, censorship and you know by creating these new technologies you can actually create new well, means to yeah. well uh, not only transmit data but block the transmission of data. I was going to say actually that you know this actually <laughs> maybe slightly annoyingly ties in with our kind of next next podcast about privacy and the new kind of challenges concerned with kind of state intervention and other forms of privacy concern created by new technology. It's almost a shame you're not coming back next week. <laughs> it, it's not quite so simple to say that uh, geodatabase control is evil. And I'm, 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 radio I'm, I'm is, saying is, it kind of poses new kind of privacy um, conversations. I'm not saying it's evil. Geodatabase is actually a very useful tool for mm -hmm. regulators because, it, for instance, it allows Wi-Fi in rural areas to operate at much higher powers than they can mm -hmm. operate in cities if the... Um, database tells the device that there's no signals that mm. will be interfered with, you know, right. you can increase your power, then that's a good thing that will allow for more rural Wi-Fi coverage. Mm. Um, the problem is, is that the, the rules are being developed and the ideas are being um, advanced on the basis of uh, the government being a democracy who's mm. actually um, held, you know, accountable. held accountable yeah. to, the, right. to, the pub to the public. Um, the tool of database control in the hands of, say, a, an Iran or a yeah, Russia as we were talking or about something earlier. is yeah. quite different. Right. And so I've been quite concerned that um, at least the option of TV white space use without database control be kept alive. Because mm. th there's really no good pathway for the development of cognitive radio sure. unless, unless there's a market for it. Mm. And the market is... is we had hoped would be in the TV white space area, but now it's been taken over by the geodatabase control solution. Right, interesting. I, I mean, a lot of people, I think, will listen to this and say, you know, um, you know signal sent over a spectrum that can be picked up by your phone. I mean, how is this different, say, from 3G or, or LT technology? A, th a cellular network manages its users' devices. Mm -hmm. the, the network itself picks the frequency for the users yep. to, to use. And, it, and it's a wonderful thing because you... you pick up your phone, you make a phone call, you never break into somebody else's conversation mm. as you used to that do goes. on landlines. Because yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. the network management built into cellular is very effective. Mm -hmm. But a system like Wi-Fi has no uh, comparable network management tool to avoid interference. When I turn nice. on my Wi-Fi, I can I can be subject to interference from the pizza parlor and you know the right. next, yeah, next yeah, building yeah, yeah. or the you know my neighbors There's downstairs. There's no protection for that kind of for that yeah. spectrum. Yeah, channel selection is made by the end user and not by mm. the network. Right. So it's okay. a, it's a, it's a it's a shortcoming of Wi-Fi, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't know where you want to go with that. But I, you know, I think it's just more kind of just kind of clarifying. The, the issue the here is that radios that are smart enough to manage their own frequency use mm -hmm. don't need to have such strict controls by national governments. Right. Mm. Um, radios that are dumb and have to be told what frequencies to use are dependent on the national government to decide, you know, you get to use that frequency, you don't. Mm. Right. Okay. So a smart radio is a powerful tool for liberalizing access mm. to the radio spectrum. So, I mean, mm. it, it does, it goes beyond Wi-Fi, I guess. I mean, you were saying that this this concept could be used with other technologies like mm -hmm. like LTE. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, but you know, on the other hand, LTE is finding that they don't have enough spectrum, mm. and so they're just now starting to look at the possibility of using LTE in unlicensed bands, right. okay. where they will have to coexist with Wi-Fi. Right. And the coexistence between Wi-Fi and LTE is. I hope it'll work, but it's going to be tough because there's a limited amount of spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the behavior of, of LTE and cellular in general is to act as if there's nobody else using the spectrum and the network management mm -hmm. you know has has full access to mm -hmm. all of the bandwidth that's there but in an unlicensed band that's not true there are other users so LTE has to be modified to be a little more polite than right. it is in its own bands right you know and and that's just now being worked out okay interesting and I, I think this maybe links in quite nicely with some work that you've done recently with the European Commission on on how uh... can I just briefly stop you before you go into that I mean okay. I know the kind of general focus of this podcast is LTE but I've got to say I find this um this idea about kind of the importance of having kind of independent radio access for kind of citizens as mm. a kind of tool of resistance I think it's absolutely kind of fascinating because obviously radio is this kind of incredibly rich history in terms of um both in terms of authoritarian control like in Rwanda or in terms of kind of resistance, I mean, you kind of imagine um, kind of uh, Jews in Germany listening to the radio, uh, British broadcasts. So I think it's just kind of really interesting hearing you talk about the kind of continuing relevance of, of the radio to um, uh, and, and the importance of the radio to kind of uh, democratic expression. I just find that really, <laughs> I, mean, I just find that really fascinating. It's, 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 like it's a different context. radio, right? It's, no, it, I know, but not. I think it's not. There, there, it's not, though, is it? It's, not. it's, it's the, the same, same thing. It's the same thing, right. but, but it's it's a it's a defect in our language that yeah. we use radio for radio broadcasting, uh -huh. but it's also used for point to point and other forms yeah. of communication. I mean, there's I more a, meant just the kind of broadcast and reception, right, which is right. the same kind of radio. There, I didn't mean a, literally. Yeah, kind of, I mean, we talk. Yeah, So I know that you were a ham radio enthusiast, but. Uh, many years ago. Uh, well, no, I'll tell you why. I never became a ham because you have right, to have okay. a license to be a ham, uh -huh. and I oppose licensing. No, I was uh, going to say, yeah, for, for that kind of that. purpose. So okay. I, I refused to get a license. Okay. And that was considered quite heretical in the in the amateur community, and I never was allowed to to operate in the amateur bands. Oh right, okay. You know, well, um, rebel without Remember, a amateurs were there before there were licenses. You know, mm -hmm. Marconi didn't need a license to do his his <laughs> development work when he was, you know, in the early it was, days. It was it was all white space back then. It was yeah. all white space. <laughs> that's, that's right. Cool. That's right. That is excellent. But but Stephen Lawson, who's a great journalist in in the field that I work in, uh, put a t tweet on Twitter saying, you know, I use radio all the time, but I never listen to radio. Mm. It's just a, a, a shortcoming in our language, yeah. at least in English, yeah. that we use the same word for broadcasting as well as for other forms of right. wireless communication. Mm. Anyway, it's, the same, it's the same yeah. material. Back to, uh, no, back I, to I think uh, where, you were, a, where you were going. That was a really worthwhile interjection. Actually. Good. I'm, gl I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was going to, yeah, I just wanted to bring up, even if briefly, um, so the work that you've been doing um, or recently completed with the European Commission on um, yeah, the, the use of LTE or the suitability of LTE in, in um, mission critical uh, situations, I think it was. Um, so I think that... Can we define mission critical? I think that might be... Well, maybe you can well that's a that. tough thing yeah. to define, but l let me go back to say that we had, we had written a study for the uh, European Commission mm -hmm. a few years ago, and we pointed out that um, one of the reasons why people think there's a shortage of radio spectrum is because we have this tradition of creating networks for very, very, very narrow purposes. You mm -hmm. have a network for taxis, you have a network for um, hospitals to use, right. you have a network. For, right. So you have all these people that, that need access to the spectrum intermittently, mm -hmm. but they have a license that gives them almost a monopoly over specific frequencies so even when they're not using it nobody else can use the the resource mm -hmm. and then in, 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 in a system like cellular which is able to pool multiple users on a common infrastructure it's much more spectrally efficient right than these dedicated networks right. that have been the tradition of private radio so i guess that's the so we, we pointed that out yeah. that if you know one of the reasons why there appears to be a the scarcity of spectrum is because you have all these privately yeah. uh, created You have Tetra networks. here in the UK. Which is, is it for possible? The the, the, so the commission fire. asked us, right. the commission came to us and asked, is it possible for all, some of these private users to actually use the public cellular networks mm. and get rid of their private 
mm-hmm. networks. Can police and fire and emergency medical and rescue mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. crisis communications, can they really just get rid of their private networks and all use public cellular? We had to look at that. Well, that's very interesting because I think we, we, we advocate a new metric for coverage, which is rather than looking at, for LTE specifically, mm-hmm. uh, which doesn't involve looking at geographic coverage. It looks at the proportion of time that users have access to the network. Um, we don't. We don't say this is better than geographic coverage. We say it's kind of an alternative way of better understanding kind of the true experience of users. Obviously, for kind of a, a user, it's more important that a street with hundred thousand people walking down it a day has LTE coverage mm-hmm. than a field that no one goes. And obviously, we say the big caveat to this, of course, is that you know you want total two much geographic two G coverage much more important so people can access uh, you know emergency services things like that. And it's so it's kind of interesting to hear you say that actually, you know, in the immediate future, things like LTE may be mission critical. They might be actually kind of crucial to have LTE access for all these essential services okay. that maybe now you don't need them. Well, it's not quite that simple because it, it's, 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 I think, a stretch to think that today's networks can offer mm. an adequate, reliable enough well, level I think this is of service they definitely can't. I mean, for you know. mission critical users. So one of the things we recommended was that the networks be made more resilient, harder, more survivable, mm. um, and, and more widely available. Than cellular is today. There are gaps in coverage, which but boy, don't we know it? You know, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That's your that's work. What we do. That's yeah. your work. The, the 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 coverage of cellular networks is very closely aligned with where the population is, right. which is which okay for for, yeah. for for public users like you know ordinary people, but firemen have to be able to go into forests and put out yeah. fires in right. places where there may not be a, a local population. Well, this is, I think it's been on exactly so, point so, about so that there on. might not be cellular coverage or a rescue mission may yeah. have to go to a, a place you know a, a, you know in a cave for instance mm. well, where there's no cellular. Coverage. I think that's kind of what we've always said is that you know it's important to look at these different types of coverage in different ways. I mean you know obviously LTE is kind of at the moment a kind of um, low priority kind of um, high uh, uh, utility for the user service you, you mean you don't need LTE to phone the police for instance I mean it's not a kind of essential service yet look LTE doesn't even have voice call capabilities well, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> when you're using your LTE, fee, LTE HB, phone you're actually falling back to GSM to make the voice call yes as we've, uh, we've noticed and that's really interesting I mean that does seem to fit in again with your point that you know would it be just more efficient to use a single technology i mean it's a it's a parallel it's an echo of the same argument and i mean obviously there are there is or, or there are networks operating voice over lte um and i i sort of wonder if we'll be able to see some kind of consolidation in the future maybe you know people will stop using um i mean certainly i don't watch TV anymore. I don't watch. I don't. I don't, I don't use that frequency or that technology, if you like. Um, and I just wonder if, in the future, we'll see more consolidation like that. And, and I wonder if, well, if if that's a good thing, or whether we need these. I mean, certainly, it makes sense to have different technologies because you know you have different frequencies and you have, um, you know, you have in building, you have out uh, outdoors as well, but. Certainly for things like TV and, and cellular, it's a kind of parallel use case. You know, I'm in my home and I want to access, uh, you know, I want to access something on my phone or I want to watch it on a screen on my wall. Um, do you have broadcasting on is very efficient use mm-hmm. of spectrum if you have very large numbers of people who need to watch the same content or program simultaneously, mm-hmm. and that lends itself, say, to sporting events, to Euro song competitions or public emergencies and stuff. Mm. I love that your but, second example but, is the Eurovision Song Contest. That's, so, <laughs> that's your second go-to. That's well, so that great. has a huge audience. It does, it does. I'm not saying it doesn't. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. But but otherwise, I think people prefer to pick and choose what they want to watch, when mm. they want to mm-hmm. watch it, so that on-demand video all, yeah. is, is yeah. also a very attractive solution, even though it's a much less efficient use of spectrum. Mm. It's still end users prefer, you know, the, the ability to control when and where they watch. You well, know, yeah, it's like that. So, Sorry. but but the fact is, efficiency is not the only issue. Mm. Um, if you if you rely on efficiency as the only criteria, yes, a single network for all purposes is the most efficient. There would be no competition. There would be no redundancy in case of a you know network failure. Mm. So efficiency comes with costs. Yeah. And that's the point we make in, in our study. Yes, it is more efficient to have everybody use a common network, but 
If you do so, you lose the redundancy and the resilience that comes right. from multiple networks, and uh, and the fact that there are different use cases where you know the 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 architecture which is most efficient for delivering content yeah. to millions of people is not the same that's most efficient for delivering a message from one location to another yeah. to, to a specific person in another location mm. yeah mm. you know so there's limits to the efficiency argument well i think i, I don't know um i, I find i think this is sort of fascinating discussion i feel a little bit like a con cognitive radio go, go on all night yeah, yeah i feel like a little bit like a cognitive radio that's switching between <laughs> channel, various different, different channel. channels yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, exploring uh, sort of a, a a little bit of let's say quite a lot of white space um but uh what's well, an exciting time to be involved in wireless communications this is really mm. in some sense golden age of wireless technology and it's not over i mean just the fact that people are starting to think about uh, you know a thousand times more um, bandwidth mm. being available for broadband internet or a thousand times mm. more efficiency for um, communications if, if you had raised the possibility of there being a thousand fold improvement in efficiency of spectrum use five years ago, people would have laughed at you and said, mm. it's just not possible. You know, you're, you're just dreaming. But now entire industries believe that it actually is a solvable problem, you know, so that the work on developing 5G, you know, the next yeah. generation after 4G, um, they're expecting to be more than just an incremental improvement, but mm. a big leap. Yeah. And the fact that there's, you know, a, agreement that a big leap is possible is what makes this such an exciting time. I think it's kind of amazing that, you know, come a point not too far in the future where we'll look back on today's broadband like we look back on 56K. Like, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the same thing. How or, do we or, ever live with or that? Or 2400 volts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. quite. A bit before my, bit before my time. Yes. Well, I think this is a great, uh, uh, like a very um, opportune moment, moment to, um, to thank you for your, for your time here because it, it leads, you've given, you've provided us with a perfect link to talk about our next, um, next topic, topic, which yeah. is LTE speeds. Ah, um, so, brilliant. well, brilliant. thank you very much, um, Bob, for, okay, for joining sure. us. Um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure, real pleasure having you on. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank Cheers. you. So we talked with Colin about the importance of measurement and all the interesting things that you can learn from measuring network mm -hmm. speeds. And we just saw from Bob uh, a little bit of people's expectations for 5G. Um, so let's talk now about the present. Let's talk about the state of LTE, okay? So you just published a report um, called, what was it? The Coincidentally, the state of LTE. Okay. Almost like you knew that. Um, looking at the performance of mobile networks around the world, looking at the performance of 4G mobile networks, both in terms of download speed, but also in terms of... Um, the availability of the network, the proportion of time that users have access to it. And that, that's basically, that's a metric that we've come up with ourselves. Um, so uh, I guess the easy way of explaining that is it just takes an average of the time that each user has access to LTE. Um, and I think it's, I just want to point out here, it's quite an interesting metric because unlike geographical coverage, um, it can actually decrease. Yeah, so this is the thing. I mean, we, we thought about comparing time on LTE from last year's report. We released this report around this time last year with this year's. And then we thought, you know, that might be a bit misleading for consumers. And, you know, networks obviously go up in arms if you tell them, you know, from last year to this year, uh, this network's coverage has decreased according to this mm. metric. And they'll say, well, we've built more towers, we've increased coverage. You don't know what you're talking about, um, which is obviously not true. But it would, you know, the point is, is that our metric just looks at the proportion of time a user has access to the network. So it kind of emphasized the areas where users spend the most time. Yeah. So obviously we consider LTE this kind of um, uh, very recent, um, uh, important, but important but new technology to kind of, um, to really kind of boost users' engagement in ways that may be less essential than something like being able to make a voice call to get the emergency services yeah. in, say. I think we covered this a bit, I covered mm. this a bit with Bob. Um, so, you know, for us, it's more, you know, this records air at streets, say, where like you get a million users kind of walking up and down a month yeah. as more important than a, a field where someone only goes once a month. Yeah. But I, but also, obviously, um, the reason it can decrease is as networks mm. add more towers yeah. and they go into more marginal regions and then they start marketing the network yeah. in, in new sort of 
out of um and i think if there is one city. weakness if there is yeah. one weakness of the metric and i think it's a very good one it's very useful for comparing it to traditional geographic metrics is that you know if a network moves into a new market a new town and builds mm. an lte tower then for the first time users in that town will have access to lte but you know if there's only one tower they're only going to access yeah. kind of 10 yeah, percent yeah. of the time so it brings down the overall average but at the same time is increasing overall access yeah. Yeah. so i think that's the kind of it's an important thing to bear in mind when you consider these numbers yeah um but yeah, so um, our data kind of, so we, we looked at every country where we could see where there was um, uh, LTE and we compared the network performance within the country, but also internationally, just to kind of benchmark where everyone is in the world. And, uh, you know, the results were quite interesting. So Vodafone Spain were the fastest network in the world with download speeds of just over 18 megabits per second, which is pretty fast. But I think, you know, based on kind of what people imagined for LTE right. is maybe a little bit kind of slower. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the specs that were originally laid out and, and still stand, I think, were 100 megabit per second. I think, mm. I mean, that's under sort of optimal conditions so that, you know, the, the device isn't moving, I think. I mean, the um, ITU's theoretical standard for, um, for 4G was 100 megabits per second. Yeah. And obviously, you know, that's under test conditions. Yeah. It just hasn't, you know, it hasn't been kind of maybe lived up to. And I think it's worth pointing out here is, is, as well that we're doing end-to-end -end user testing. So we're not testing the LTE technology on its own. We're testing that technology within the entire network. So when we say that Vodafone LTE is, you know, 20 megabits or, or 18, around 18 yeah. megabits per second, um, it's not we're actually measuring you know the entire time that it takes a typical piece of uh, a file a typical mm. file to um reach the user um instead of measuring just the the data transfer speeds between the user and the tower so it, it takes into account backhaul it takes into account mm. the links that the networks have um uh, in terms of peering and, and and with common cdns so it's um uh, but, I, I mean, I think that's actually I've a also strength. I've just realised that 18 is the average for Spain. Oh, and right. that it's 25 megabits per second, yeah, for uh, for Vodafone Spain. You were well, quite right. Good clarification. We don't actually have 20. to edit this now. Yeah, so. exactly. You know, yeah. Makes um, my job a lot easier. But, um, so, I mean, I, I think, I personally think, well, you can look at this either as a, a shortcoming or as an advantage of our approach. Um, and obviously we're going to tell you that it's an advantage but you can you can see why you might just want to measure the technology itself yeah i, I think we're all about you know um as you've said before kind of we're all about measuring exactly what the user sees so you know we don't the user doesn't care necessarily what is impacting their download speed they're not necessarily interested i mean they're obviously interested in whether what, what impact their device has mm. and actually we've got something coming out on that relatively soon um, the device has, they don't, they don't really care about what impact the kind of base station technology has. They don't care about what impact the geography they're in has. They just care about the speeds they're getting. And so, you know, we're very interested in kind of recording all of that and presenting it as a kind of true to life metric a measured from the point of view of the consumer metric that I think kind of bears more, like more reality to what people experience. Right. I mean, you know, you see all these adverts for, you know, 50 megabits per second or whatever kind of yeah. broadband, and yet you know that your Netflix is streaming at far from the highest quality yeah i mean it's it's clear that i think we're very trying to kind of put something a little bit different and there's lots of other different companies out there measuring um trying to really isolate the network's role in the mm. speed and that's a very important thing to be studying but it's you know we think by offering something slightly different we're kind of helping consumers get a better understanding yeah i guess for me the interesting kind of story here with respect to the future is that for, for 5g to be really effective you know it's not just going to be a matter of rolling out more you know a new tower technology mm -hmm. it, it's going to be about the backhaul so network how networks send data between towers and and um through data centers and it may even be as you say about the devices and we'll, we'll talk about that more when the device report is out mm. but there's certainly you know there's certainly some devices that i just don't think would you know, cope or some, they mm. theoretically can't cope with. Um, well, I mean, my iPhone four doesn't have LTE. I mean, you yeah. know, in a kind of very yeah. obvious example, let I mean, alone with the theoretical. Even maximum, if it had an LTE there. radio, there are certain device, mm. or even if they had an LTE radio, there's just certain devices where, you know, the processors just 
going to burn out if you yeah, try and yeah, 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 stuff yeah. too quickly. Um, which is not what anyone wants. Um, but yeah, so we released this report around a week ago. It's kind of snapshot the kind of global you know, state of LTE, which is mm. now expression I think we said about four times. Um, and, you know, so it has some kind of very interesting interesting results, um, I think, especially South Korea performed right. extremely well. You know, their, their three have... main networks, kind of Ole, LG U+, mm. and SK Telecom, are all, you know, very fast. They're all kind of mm. around the 15 megabits per second range, which is, you know, if the fast, you know, is actually very fast. Yeah, um, and very good time, was it? And their time on LTE, yeah. I mean, LG U+, are a network with... 99% time on LTE, which yeah. basically means if you're in South Korea and you're on that network, you are on LTE the whole time, which I think the best network in the UK was EE mm. for that metric, and they were just over 50%. I like think it'd 60%. be interesting, yeah. I think it could be, well, you know, we should, and I mean, we do produce geographical breakdowns of these metrics as yeah. well, at least for, for our clients. We um, don't, for these global reports, we don't. But I think it'd be interesting to look at South Korea because there is a big um sort of highly centralized urban population i mean it basically is an urban country yeah i mean it's so heavily populated and so it's very rural areas as well that's true so, that is true but, but I mean, I, you know, I, yeah you have such an intensity of kind of um, i guess just people yeah people don't go there so much um yeah and and vodafone spain by contrast very high download very speed. high download speed low uh low time on lte yeah um and i think we're trying now to release this report every three months mm -hmm. um which is now a commitment i've made <laughs> on, on youtube and on the podcast so we're gonna have to do it um and i think you know we will therefore be tracking uh tracking the changes in speed over time and i would ex you know what we've seen through our kind of years of studying mobile network performance is that networks decline over time uh, in terms of 4G networks, they, they get slower as we see them, yeah. as they get more congested. They decline in speed. They decline time. in speed over time, obviously, coverage increases, um, or hopefully coverage increases. Um, but so I expect, you know, we will see over the next kind of year of, you know, the next three or four reports, mm. I would expect to see Vodafone's speed come down. And, you know, that shouldn't be taken, Vodafone Spain's speed come down. Uh, and that shouldn't be taken as kind of, you know, oh, the network's kind of going bad or, yeah. you know, uh, this is just what happens. As more users come onto networks, they slow down. And yeah. I think, you know, often you get these headlines when we release reports like this, which make overtime comparisons. You hear people say, oh, my network was 18 megabits per second last year and now it's 11. Yeah. I mean, that's terrible. Why am I paying the same amount? But it's just, you know, it's what it's what is to be expected. Yeah. And actually it's still, you know, as we were saying, kind of three or four times faster than 3G. Yeah. So there's still a kind of big leap in terms of performance. Um, but yeah, um, I think we definitely want to watch because, you know, I would say the majority of cases is exactly as you say, it, but the extent to which they slow down definitely varies. So we see yes. the Nordics, you know, especially Sweden, which I think was the first country to the release first, LTE. Joint first, I think. I think it was Norway and Sweden okay. at the same time. Well, yeah. two Nordics. Then. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, just being really pernickety. Yeah. Still have very good speeds. Um, and obviously South Korea, that's had LTE, I think it was also an early LTE adopter, but excellent speeds, I think, number yeah. two. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, we've seen you know, um, the contract like Sweden and Australia have been very fast, kind of maintaining good speeds. They, both countries have slipped down a bit in our overall ranking, but then again, as more, you know, but that's right. completely related to what, you know, we were just talking about, that, you know, these new countries come in, they seem very fast, and then yeah, they naturally slow down a bit. While I think, you know, the sweet, first Swedish yeah. LTE network was launched in 2010, so it's been around for quite a long time. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, worth noticing, I mean, the bottom of this, um, bottom of our report, which we'll link from the bottom of this video, um, uh, is that, you know, there are now 124 countries with LTE. So it's really kind of, it's now, for the first time, I think, really kind of a global technology. Sure. Um, which is, you know, which is exciting. Sure. Well, I guess, I mean, I don't have any more for a, for the moment. I'm excited about this device report. I think there's going to be a lot to talk about. With yeah. That. Um, so I think probably not the next podcast, but the podcast after, I think we'll probably have a quite a juicy, juicy amount to talk about. And I think, yeah, next time, hopefully we will be, I'm going to be publishing something, uh, actually the text of a speech I gave on privacy. Uh, at four years from now in Barcelona, so I think we're going to be talking quite a lot about about privacy and how it relates to kind of what we're doing here at Open Signal. I think it's a very important subject, and you know one that we you know want to address. Great, cool, brilliant.